go, hi everyone, I'm Kat, and you can see Paul there too. We're going to introduce ourselves in just a moment, but I thought just before we get into the session, let, um, we'll just kind of run through some of the Zoom stuff so everyone um, kind of knows how the session's going to work. Oh, welcome to insert name of session. The name of the session is um, about movement building and people power. Um, if you know someone that's trying to get in, there's a number there to um, to call Wendy. It's 0121-474-5900. Um, so if someone gets stuck in the waiting room or can't quite get in technically, um, give that number a call. Um, but we have got um, someone making sure people are coming in. So hopefully that should be OK if people are in the waiting room. Um, just a reminder, we are um, recording um, all of the session, um, so just to let you know that, so that other people um, can can see it if they can't be here. Um, Paul, next slide. Um, so, um, if you, we're gonna, how this session is gonna work is Paul and I have a bit of a presentation that we're gonna run through. If um, you can't understand us, we're speaking too fast, you've got some clarification, then um, hold up your yellow sign I'm not quite sure how I, I will try and see if I can see you but there's a lot of faces so hopefully I'll see if you hold up a yellow card but we're going to stop we are going to have a lot of time for questions and discussion at the end um, hopefully this session is going to um, inspire and and give you some thoughts and some questions that you want to dive into. Um, so either use the yellow card or um, feel free to post your questions in the chat as we go this and at the end we'll try and go clashing sessions. Sorry, there's a What's number that, Darren? of Darren, there shouldn't be any sessions clashing at the moment. I think there's just one running. Hopefully we'll be okay. Um, but yeah, also just to say, post into the chat if um, if there's questions that come to mind as we go. And Paul and I will try and um, get through them all um, at the end of the session as well. So we're aiming to end the session at 5.15 and we want to keep you all to time. So that's what we're going to work towards. Next slide, Paul. Um, so some Zoom basics, um, do um, stay on mute um, if you're not talking, so that's that um, microphone button. Um, if you'd like to um, turn your video um, on, please do. If you want to have it turn it off to have a snack, take a break, just have it off and chill out for a bit, then no worries, feel free to turn your video off, whatever you're comfortable with. Um, in terms of kind of seeing everyone in the presentation, you can choose a gallery view if you want to see as many people as you can. Um, when the when we're presenting as we are now, you'll, you might only see a few people's um, faces, but you can um, pull um, pull the image out to see a few more. Um, or you can also just click on the speaker view if you just want to see the person that's um, speaking. Um, if the videos are in the way, you can move the black drag the black bar to um, move them around so you can see the content. Um, and yeah, as I mentioned, um, please use that chat button there. If you um, post any comments or questions in as you go, then we'll try and come to those questions at the end of the session and answer as many as we can. So hopefully that is everything. Oh, yep, one more thing. Let me just move everything around so I can see it. Oh yeah, and if you're having any problems with the sound, please check your sound settings um, at, under preferences. Um, if you have headphones in, you'll probably have to change the settings as default. It might be likely that it's connected to your computer speakers. So head to preferences um, and sound if you have any sound issues to figure out. Cool. Okay, so let's introduce ourselves. So um, my name's Kat Sladden and I'm a campaigns and communications consultant. And I'm, at the moment I'm working to build an impact accelerator for um, grassroots and community activists to um, launch campaigns and win change. I used to be campaigns director at Change.org, the big petition website. So I've spent a lot of my um, career supporting people who have never campaigned on anything before to um, start a campaign, build an audience for it and hopefully win change. And the last years I've been working with the uh, bereaved um, families and survivors of the Grenfell Tower fire in their campaigns for justice and change. Um, so I'm really passionate about how um, anyone, ordinary people can come together and create change on their own terms um, and the tools that are out there and the techniques that are out there to help you do that. And I was really excited to hear about social care's futures and to be involved in this conference because I think social care is a huge issue that affects so many people across the UK. And I think there should be a huge movement for change to make social care 
um, better um, and make all of our lives better through it. So, um, so I'm excited to share with you some thoughts today from other campaigns and movements I've been involved in with the hope that it might trigger your thinking as you're thinking about how do you turn what you're doing into a wider public movement to win the change that you want to see in the world. And I'm gonna hand over to Paul, who is my excellent partner this afternoon for this session. Thanks, Kat. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Paul Di Gregorio, and I'm the founder of an organisation called Rally. Um, Rally is a bit of a mobilisation hub, um, which was formed to help progressive organisations of all sizes really attract, activate and engage the public at scale to kind of mobilise support for their uh, value uh, around their values and to help deliver on their uh, mission. So we help um, progressive groups of all kinds um, encourage people to kind of turn up, to speak up, or maybe even to cough up. Um, we develop strategies and frameworks which help organizations do that. I'm really, really excited to be here with Kat. Every time Kat asks me to do something, I always say yes, because she's amazing. And I'll hand back to Kat. Cool, thanks Paul. Kick it on to uh, the next slide. Paul's in charge of the deck today. So yeah. Um, both Paul and I are really passionate about how people power is driving the fight for justice and change and how actually it's grassroots now that are really leading the way. I think, you know, they're quite often beating and being more successful about making change than many of the kind of big traditional NGOs. Um, and hopefully, this, like I said, this session is really to share some lessons from other campaigns that we've been involved in, how movement building works behind the scenes. Hopefully it will kind of encourage and inspire you to take some of those actions um, and see how you can apply them to the work that you're trying to do. So if you kick it on, Paul. Um, so yeah, we're going to give you some context and lessons from people powered campaigns. I'm going to share a couple of examples that I've been involved in and why I think they were successful. Um, and then Paul is going to talk to you about how you mobilize people to act, to really take action to support you, which is really key if you're trying to make change. And then we're going to leave a good amount of time for kind of questions and discussions so you can pick our brains, you can challenge us on stuff that you um, want to challenge us on and hopefully we can get into a good conversation because Paul and I just love chatting. Um, anything movement building and people power. Um, so I thought it was worth just starting with, you know, what is a movement? I think we, we talk about movements a lot these days. Um, lots of organisations say they're building a movement. Um, this is the simplest definition that I think of as a movement, a group of people who are mobilised to take action, driven by a shared vision of how the world should be. So the starting point is to have a shared vision of how the world should be and I know at Social Care Futures you you have this vision that you're working towards um, that is encompassing and really about um, where you see the world and people in it so you've already got that part but then it's about how you gather people together and get them taking action for you so movements aren't about top-down leaders doing all the work they're about really inspiring people to act and feel that they're part of something and that you're all working together for your vision so that's really why we're going to spend a lot of today session talking about well how do you encourage people to take action and what kind of action can they take to help you um, to achieve your vision and these are just some images of um, you know some of the incredible movements that I think we see around the world and the different inspiring leaders that make them up. Next slide Paul. Um, so I thought I'd just kick off with um, uh, just go back one Paul was that back or is that Oh, come on, that was my next one. Okay, so I just threw this one, this slide in because I really love this stat and I find it something that really encourages me when I'm thinking about a big, huge issue in the world that I want to change. Um, and these researchers looked at lots of social movements and um, protest movements around the world and they calculated that the successful ones um, succeeded when they'd got 3.5% of the population um, to take action um, and sustain action for their cause. Um, and many of them actually succeeded with even far less than that. So no campaigns failed once they'd achieved the active and sustained participation of 3.5% of the population, and lots of them succeed with far less than that. And I just think when we're trying to create big change in the world, it's really inspiring to think is you don't actually have to get every single person in the country behind you. What you need is a small but really committed group of people who are taking action and working with you. Um, and as people take action with you, they, um, they turn out for your protests, they 
sign your petitions they go to out with their friends or talk to their friends and talk and advocate for your issue so it's about getting a small minority of people but getting them really active and really inspired with you and I just find that stat something to give me a bit of hope when we're trying to think about how we um, change the world and get people to our cause don't have to win 100 percent 3.5 percent is a magic number thanks Paul um, so I thought I'd start with a few, just a few little examples from um, my time at Change.org and really why I wanted to um, share a few of these is just to say that literally anyone can make change in the world and the tools that exist out there these days make it more possible. So for example, um, some small petitions that were involved in at Change.org but that led on to bigger ripple effects was Caroline Crado Perez campaigning to have a woman on our banknotes having had, you know, all the historical figures on the banknotes were all men. So she fought really hard to get a woman on a banknote and she won that campaign and um, that's why you have Jane Austen on the £10 note um, and then she used the momentum from that petition to also campaign to get um, a statue of Melissa Forsyth outside parliament because she saw outside parliament all the statues were of men um, and again very specific petition lots of people supported her she had lots of pushback that it was going to be too expensive it wasn't possible it was too difficult but in the end she won and we got the statue there um and the thing about what Caroline does well is she picks something really specific, um, but that it speaks to a much broader issue, you know, a conversation about where are where we place women in our history and who we who we look to in our history as examples. And her work and her petitioning, along with others on the site, we found was just inspiring more and more people to think about what feminist causes they wanted to start. So Laura Courtin had signed Caroline's petition, she'd signed other feminist petitions on the site, and that inspired her to start her um, campaign to drop VAT on tampons and she said Laura always says the first ever protest she ever went to was the protest that she started herself to end the tampon tax which is just incredible so she'd never campaigned on anything before she was a student she was actually bored and procrastinating when she was meant to be revising for exams and that's how she started the petition um, and she you know it she campaigned for a few years and she's she, she won and the government not only committed to drop the VAT but while the VAT is still being collected they're donating that money to women's rights charities so you know these days you can be sat behind your bedroom at home have a laptop and be able to inspire and create change and not only win a petition that you care about but by doing it you might also inspire other people to copy and follow their petitions next slide Paul um, and it's not just kind of small petitions. I think, you know, the example that we've seen recently of Marcus Rashford, 23 year old, and yes, he's got millions of Twitter followers, um, but he's 23 years old, never really campaigned on anything before in his life, but has personal experience of what it feels like to be hungry as a child and what it feels like to be a parent trying to raise children and be worried about where you're going to get your meal. And he used the tools that, that he had telling his compelling story leading with his heart not worrying about kind of all the different policy changes and just saying why he thought um children should get free school meals over the holidays so first time around it was a simple letter that he shared on twitter and he asked everyone to retweet and tag their local mps simple action people could take um that, and he won that for the first school holiday and then for the second school holiday he launched his petition on the government website which has now got over a million signatures um, and I would say it's, with petitions it's not really about numbers actually um, I've seen petitions win with a lot lower numbers Caroline's petitions always have had around 30,000 people so not that high but it's about how you get the people that sign to take action and be loud and make sure it's not just about the petition so even when that petition lost in you know the government hasn't agreed to his demands what we then saw was this huge outpouring of people saying you know what we're going to do something ourselves and I think what Marcus did so successfully by being someone that's not a campaigner and not a professionalist he's saying look I'm doing what I can and that inspired other people to think well if he can do if he can speak out and do that what can I do to be part of this change and we've just you know you'll all have seen the hundreds of restaurants and cafes doing their bit everywhere and that's when when you're building a movement that's when you know that you've inspired something when people start to do stuff that you didn't even ask them to do and they come up with even more creative ideas than you could possibly think of um, and that's the power of kind of online tools and movement building and it's also the power that 
um, people that have experience of the issues and the real stories to tell, that is a powerful tool that no organization can have that you have when you're driving your campaigns. And that's what people connect to. Next slide, Paul. Um, so, um, and I really believe in some of the work that I do is thinking about, okay, well, how does activism meet strategy? Because when you have a little bit behind the scenes of some smart strategy and they're working hand in hand, that's when change really takes hold. And I just thought I'd share a few minutes about um, some of the work that I've been doing with the Grenfell families. Um, and I share this because um, I think it's really easy to think, you know, this was a huge national disaster. Of course it was. And that's why it's in the news. And that's why um, the campaign's been successful. But actually we see time and time again, you have these huge events that are front page news and then two weeks, three weeks, a month later the news moves on the politicians move on um, and the attention fades and actually what we've seen with Grenfell is it's been the strength of the community and the families behind the scenes campaigning organizing themselves that has led them to be able to keep going to keep building up pressure and to become a voice that the government the government wanted to write them off and the media wanted to write them off and actually they haven't been able to so three years on they're still fighting but they're fighting from a position of power and influence because they've done a lot of the hard work next slide paul um, yeah, so Grenfell United, the group I work with, they um, organised literally in the days after the fire, they were meeting in a community in a rugby club just under the tower. And it was one of the only community centres that banned press, media, anyone that wasn't a direct survivor or a bereaved family member. So it was like a safe haven for them. And they realised in the days after the fire that Yes, volunteers were coming to help them, but actually no one in authority was helping them. Um, so they started organizing themselves. Um, and within, um, I think the first week, they decided that they needed to form a group and they gave themselves a proper mandate. And they about 100 families came together in a hotel in um, North Ken in West London. Um, and they voted for a small team, a small committee of other of survivors and bereaved that would lead them. Um, and they gave themselves a mandate to, um, first of all, look after the humanitarian needs of the group, but also um, to go on to fight for justice and change. And that's when Grenfell United started and how they keep fighting. Next slide, Paul. So one of the first things that they did, and I think I've talked to Neil a little bit about the work that you're doing around the narrative, was they had to tell their story on their own terms. And what we often find is the media want to put people into boxes. They want to say, you know, you're a case study or you're a victim and they want to interview on, on those terms. And a lot of the work that we did was to um, really help um, survivors and bereaved families to tell their story on their terms not as victims but as campaigners and activists that are fighting for change so what that involved was one saying no to a lot of <laughs> journalists um, that didn't want to kind of tell that story but two finding those journalists that did and really working with them to ex you know to see um, the survivors and families of people that are experts in what happened to them they know what happened to them and why it happened to them and they know what needs to change so this is Ed Defarn who was campaigning even before the fire on fire safety issues um speaking to john snow and telling his his story that way next slide paul um, and this is um, Karim, who lost his uncle in the fire, and, and Sandra, who lost her niece. Um, and this was the front page of The Guardian on the anniversary. And again, it was really um, a story about the fight that they are and the campaigning work they're doing, but also the friendship that families are forming doing this work. And again, it was really important for us to not just tell the story of victims again, but to tell the story of real people who are fighting for change. And I do really think, and we can talk more about it in the questions or later, but by taking control of your story, by setting the narrative yourself, and by deciding that when you do media and press work, what you're going to do is do it for the purpose of bringing change, you can kind of reclaim some of the power. Um, for example, we went and met with the deputy editor of the Times, and the Times were not covering Grenfell very well, but when they met face to face with three um, survivors and some bereaved families, their, their, edit, their editor really started to understand the story and the story of corruption that had led to the fire and their coverage of the fire has changed from that day. So there's something for me about reclaiming the story for yourselves and thinking about the terms of which you're going to talk to the media um, as you're doing your work and your campaigning. Next slide, Paul. 
Um, and then also big moments. So, you know, we need to keep things in the news. We need to keep the public attention on the cause. And um, this is just an example of um, being creative in campaigning. So on the second anniversary of the fire, um, we knew that there were so many buildings that still had dangerous materials on them across the country. So many buildings that were still not fire safe and people didn't really know about it. And the government was getting away with not doing anything. Um, so we had this idea to project huge messages. This is a real image of a projection onto tower blocks, one in London, one in Newcastle, one in Manchester, saying, this building still has cladding on it. You know, this building has no sprinklers. This building has no um, fire doors. Um, and we work with the residents in those buildings. So there were real issues from real residents in the building. And this um, image went across the newspapers and it encouraged, um, you know, people to sign up as well and write to their MPs. And it really got the message out there that this was a national issue. And about a month or two later, the government agreed to give more money to get the cladding down. Now we're still fighting that issue um but you know this was just a big moment for us to put it on the map so we kind of do a lot of everyday campaigning and then you have these kind of huge moments where you're really trying to push things and and um it costs a little bit of money to do the projections but not that much and in a way it's a really really just simple idea and sometimes it's the simplest ideas that are um that are most powerful and you don't have to have huge budgets for the last anniversary we made um just a youtube video that was kind of bright green and we asked everyone to turn out their lights in their home and watch this video um, and we had so many people all over Twitter and Instagram taking pictures of their living rooms glowing green for Grenfell and it cost nothing to do that like it was the simplest idea so I think you can also just think of these like really simple powerful things that bring people to your cause next slide Paul I can't remember what the next slide is yeah so um this is just kind of to wrap to me and hand to Paul, but I think as you're thinking about building a campaign and a movement, it, it starts with organizing yourselves together. What are your aims? What are you working towards? What's the vision? Then you need these kind of, I call them surge moments to get into the media. Um, and that's where you have to be a bit creative. You have to be a bit inventive. It can be like a petition. It can be hooking on to some other events that's happening on the in the news right now, something that people's talking about. Um, so, you know, we see with the Marcus Rashford thing, heading up to the half-term holiday creating this kind of surge moment and then when you do break through it's about how do you sustain that how do you stay in the public attention how do you keep bringing up campaigns or issues to keep people engaged and then how do you really engage with the politicians at the other end when you've got that seat at the table to make sure that they're going to deliver their promises um, so that's just a whistle stop kind of um, tour of like how I think sort of campaigns grow I'm going to hand over to Paul um, and he's going to take you through actions and then we should have plenty of time for questions as well. Brilliant thank you so much Kat that was amazing. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about digital mobilization um, and just thinking back to what Kat was saying then around these moments of surge and how do we sustain kind of public support and public engagement with the campaigns that we're looking to run. I very much focus on this concept of mobilization which is you know how do we achieve the scale that we need to drive the change that we want to see. So very you know, thinking about that 3.5% stat that um, Kat was talking about at the beginning of the, um, the presentation is like, in the UK, that's probably around 2 million people. And not every campaign that I'm involved in drives towards 2 million people. However, by trying to focus on scale and trying to really kind of get into the public consciousness, we can drive the change that we want to see. So I, I, I frame things as mobilization, which Another dictionary definition is the action of organizing and encouraging a group of people to take collective action in pursuit of a particular objective. I'm not somebody who really focuses on the policy and the overall kind of theory of change for an organization, but where I come in and hopefully and can be really useful is in kind of designing the strategies which really, really engage the public to help take the actions that we believe we need taken to see our change. And there are two principles around digital mobilization, which I'd love to talk to you about today. I could honestly talk to you about it for two days, but we don't have two days. The first one is engagement. And then the second one is gonna be, kind of how do we kind of take lessons from really, really powerful and really successful movements of the past and apply those learnings into our digital mobilization programs? 
So first up, this concept of um, engagement. There is an organization called the Mobilization Lab um, who have this phenomenal um, kind of primer for mobilization called the Mobilization Cookbook, which I would really recommend that you find and you download and you read. It's really short, but it's really, really inspiring. I nicked this from that document. They talk about long lasting radical change needing both broad and deep engagement with the public. And broad engagement is kind of achieved via mobilization because mobilization gives us breadth. It's how we activate and it's how we grow our audience or our support base in order to really um, harness the power of the mass behind the work we want to do. And then deep engagement is achieved via organizing. So organizing gives us more depth it's how we build the more long-term structures based around people to deliver the vision of the campaign and how it exists. And they have MobLab developed with Greenpeace, this lovely um, way of framing the different stages of engagement and the different levels of kind of interaction and, com and kind of commitment to that kind of uh, mission. And what we have is these, the, at the bottom with this kind of low engagement or more passive understanding of what's going on when people are following what's going on or just observing it's they can see it's happening it's in their consciousness and then they make the kind of next step of, of becoming more involved and then we have these two other phases of contribution and endorsing which if you think about a classic kind of charity or ngo those are the kind of campaign actions or the donations or the kind of write a letter to your mp type actions and then at the top of the kind of Greenpeace engagement pyramid is this concept of owning a part of the vision or owning part of the plan. And then right at the very top with the kind of recruitment of people who can lead and really drive forward the kind of plan alongside the organization. So they almost get mistaken for staff and they are kind of very active in their communities and very active in um, organizing. So it's a kind of, it's worth reading the kind of more detailed breakdown of the model, but as a concept, we're constantly looking at this as a, as a mechanism to mobilize people. And then I mentioned movement building. Um, one of the things that we can do is really learn a lot from movements of the past. And what I'm about to show you is the kind of things that I take from really successful movements of the past in terms of how we mobilize people. So there are lots more kind of things that are involved in uh, movements that I'm about to show you. But if I'm thinking mobilization, then we kind of think about these um, five key elements. If you want people to invest some element of social capital in the thing that you're there to do, then you need to have a really clear vision and a well-articulated vision that people can really understand and see that it kind of aligns with what they want the world to be. On top of that, you need a really believable plan. Again, if you want people to invest their social capital in the movement that you have created, then people want to succeed. So we need to kind of present to them our plan, which they can see is going to have a good chance of achieving success. The third thing is values that can be easily subscribed to. People have their own value set and they wanna be kind of invested with movements and organizations where they have this kind of real um, set, set of values in common. And those values need to again, be very accessible. We don't wanna wrap them in too much professional language or professional jargon or over intellectualize them. We want really kind of base human values that people can subscribe to. And then on top of that, if we're going to kind of draw people to us, to work with us, not for us, but with us, then we need to be presenting them constantly with very useful and sometimes valuable things that they can do to help us deliver on our plan and deliver on our vision. And it always helps to have charismatic leadership or charismatic leaders at the helm to kind of ca carry us through that kind of narrative with the work that we are looking to do. I want to show you a um, really simplified version of what a digital mobilization program can look like. I've tried to make it as simple as possible for today. So over on the left-hand side, we have this attraction phase where we use our values and we use our core story and our narrative to attract people who care about that issue. 
And when we're doing that online, we're invariably doing that on our website or we're doing it with paid advertising in Facebook. And then we kind of present people this conversion moment, which I like to think of as a very low bar action, an easy door for people who share our values to walk through so that they can show us and the rest of the world that they want the same thing as we do. And it creates that moment where we can exchange contact details, which in the majority of cases would be an email address or a telephone number. And then once we've got people um, who kind of kind of signed up with us, then what we're doing is we're journeying those people where we communicate often and we're continually presenting people with a range of high bar and low bar actions that can that are rooted in our mission. So an example of a high bar action may be to turn up in real life. An example of a low bar action may be to amplify a piece of content or share one of our Facebook posts or that type of thing, but constantly giving people um, actions to take that can be um, rooted in our mission. And then always having a sense of what our high impact outcomes are and moving people towards those actions absolutely within the knowledge that not everyone will get there, but that's fine. So we may want to be recruiting organizers in local communities around the country. We may pe want people to make calls or go and actually visit their MP. They can be these kind of high bar outcomes that we're looking for. Um, I'll very quickly run you through Greenpeace so you can see that practically in action. So Greenpeace use very big moments when they have their big campaigns on screen now is an example of um, Rangtang, which was a kind of animation that they launched a few years ago, which was telling the story of dirty palm oil. Um, everyone, lots of people saw this video, I believe, I think 90 million people saw this video worldwide, 10 million in the UK. Um, and then everything moved towards this conversion moment where people would, could kind of take an action and show Greenpeace and their peers that they were in for the campaign. Again, this saw, I think, something like 1.2 million signatures globally. They also focus on everyday moments. So if you follow Greenpeace UK in Facebook, you'll see they put out a huge range of content every day. And what they're looking to do is drive interaction with their content. And then using Facebook, they are using the, um, the way that Facebook advertising works to retarget people who have interacted with that content with asks like this, asks again to sign petitions, which drive people to the top of the funnel and puts people into the Greenpeace email list, which means that then you can be communicated with regularly, each email containing one topic and asking you to do one thing. So having a real single-minded focus on the thing that they would like you to do. Um, and they really vary their asks from these high bar asks to low bar asks. So they may ask you to share content all the way up to writing a letter to an MP, CEO or brand or turning up in real life. One example I'd like to show you is when the former chancellor was running his speech at Mansion House in London. Um, Greenpeace did a level of direct action where they interrupted his speech calling for there to be a climate emergency and Greenpeace got an email out that evening at 20 past 11 in the evening, taking a real breaking news approach to breaking news with me, a supporter who was on their base, asking me to share that and kind of amplify the work that they were doing. Which brings me to rapid response, you know, being an organization which looks at what's happening in the news can be really, really um, uh, um, successful in helping you re-engage your supporter base and driving success. Um, I thought I'd bring Donald into the Zoom room just so we <laughs> could, uh, uh, could have, a, have, a, have a look at him waving goodbye. Um, so Trump uh, in 2019 basically sent some terrible series of tweets where he referred to four American citizens and kind of suggested they need to leave the USA and fix the problems in the countries for which they came. An organization called Hope Not Hate, um, who are campaign on racism and building resilience in communities all around the country against extremism, um, sent an email to their, to their, to their list, basically asking their, their supporters to sign an open letter of solidarity. So they made the action really, really easy. It was very easy to sign and people could show their solidarity around this issue. And then they asked people to share it and people shared it. 
And what I what I found out through talking to the people at Hope Not Hate is just that small action added 5,000 new email addresses to their list, which was super, super useful for them. When we're doing this mobilization, we need to be very conscious of how we speak and how we sound. Um, and my good friends who run an agency called Forward Action frame it beautifully in this kind of, we need to be talking in a horizontal, not vertical way. And just to bring that to life, if we speak in a vertical way, we would speak like the poppy on the left. We, the organization, are going to change the world, take this action to help us do it. So centering the organization and making a kind of putting a space between them and their supporter base. Whereas a horizontal approach is we can only solve this problem working together and here's how you can have impact. And we would always um, suggest that a horizontal approach to copy and writing is the right thing to do to mobilize your supporter base. You need to be very clear on your movement story and uh, Kat talked about having a clear narrative and being in control of how, you, um, how you're telling that story. You need a, a movement story which kind of identifies the problem it identifies what you're going to do about the problem and how you'll get there. And it also identifies who or what stands in the way of you achieving that goal. And having that kind of uh, that, that structure to your comms will kind of help you re-engage and re-energize your supporter base. And when you talk, it's very important to have an active as opposed to passive tone of voice. We will always be communicating in a mobilization mindset to elicit a response of some kind. And we have to be clear about what we want um, the reader to do. So I'm just gonna finish up with some key principles of digital mobilization. Um, so the first one, we need a very clear and well articulated movement story. The second one that we um, should always elevate our vision and values upfront. And I think NGOs get in a problem here where they sometimes put their products up front, so the campaign action or the financial contribution, whereas what we're suggesting is it should be vision and values up front in comms at every stretch. And having a clear strategy about how you're going to mobilise the public behind those values, thinking the Greenpeace, but also any other group that you know that uses email and digital very well to kind of attract a base and um, uh, encourage them to take action. We need very clear and very simply articulated join us propositions. So why would somebody give you their email address? So you need to make it super clear and super easy for people to do. Need to think about those things that you're going to be asking people to do. So have your list of useful and valuable things to do. And these mobilization approaches always work best when there is a single team running mobilization or there's very radical collaboration between the teams that are involved in the public facing work. And then finally, we're talking digital mobilization. So there is a need to be thinking about what the base, the, the be, being brilliant at the digital basics. So that means using good email templates, using good websites, using good landing pages, and having a, a kind of really simple to use and simple to interact with um, tech stack. So that's me. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and put us, put us back on screen. And then we would love to take your questions, observations, and reflections. And um, while I do that, Kat, do you wanna pick the first questions? Yeah, thanks, Paul. So post in the chat if you've got some questions. I'm just going to try and have a little. Um, yeah, so I think if you want to speak, maybe just put a me or a yes in the chat and I can find you. I'm just going to like while people sort of do that or hold up your yellow card and I will try and see any yellow things although I have to scroll to see you all so bear with me um, but I also just have a little scroll through the chat and just see if um, there were some questions as we went as well and there's been some interesting comments as we go so Neil was saying that he was struck by the key difference between social care futures and campaigning NGOs in this space is that you're able to show that your network is making a change in people's lives and seeking investment to grow spread or proliferate these approaches whereas NGOs often position the government as the only agents of change. Um, I saw some people talking about different campaigns that have inspired them. So Francis was saying the early days of independent living um, had to fight the big charities as well as the government and all the impetus knowledge etc came from disabled people ourselves. People were saying that campaign was really inspiring. 
there's a recommendation here for the tipping point book um how little things can make a big difference by martha king gladwell um okay i think we've got some questions um down the bottom here as well um um sanchi is asking um i think this is one for you paul what is radical collaboration yeah i work with a lot of um groups whether they be political parties or campaign groups or ngos where each of the elements that are kind of central to mobilization so it could be the advocacy team it could be the fundraising team or it could be the kind of more wider comms team they operate with their own individual kind of targets and their own individual budgets and sometimes those targets and budgets can um, they can contradict the objectives of the other functions and radical collaboration fundamentally means that we need to find a way probably, probably with more established organizations to create a team that's got a set of shared goals and most likely a shared budget so that they can all work together as a kind of cross-functional team towards one goal, which would be the mobilization goal, um, which is a, is a lot to ask for some of the more traditional and long-standing organizations. However, what I'm seeing is the kind of new grassroots uh, groups can really activate that way of thinking right from the beginning of their existence. And it always, 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 um, helps the most. Yeah, I think that's a real advantage of kind of um, grassroots organising and, and people doing it for themselves because you don't have this big kind of charity structure that you're trying to um, fight against. Um, I've seen in the chat, I uh, just saw a question. Um, John Cooper, you have a question. Did you want to let us know what that is? Hello, yeah. Um, really interesting. Thanks for the presentation. I think um, just to set the scene, what my concern would be in this sector is that the general public don't really know what social care is and I'd, I'd even go so far as to say some of the experts don't know what social care is for example there was a debate in parliament recently about um, recognition of social care workers and about 90 percent of the questions uh, ended up on nhs workers which you know had absolutely nothing to do with that very specialized debate <clears throat> And the public have got no idea what it is, how it's funded, and there are constantly, um, you know, decent articles in a range of papers from the right wing press and the left wing press. But people don't understand it, and therefore it seems it seems that they don't care. Obviously, perhaps they would if they did understand it. But I guess um, the question with that as the context is, how can we clearly articulate and ask to people who have got no idea about what you know the sector we're working in is great question i can start off paul do you want to start or I, I can start a few thoughts and then paul can jump in yeah. yeah great question and i mean i'm still learning myself about everything that you do and everything that social care stands for and i think there's a few different ways into that and i'm just offering these as a few ideas that you know there's no kind of right or wrong, wrong way to do some of this stuff um but i do think sometimes it goes back to something paul said about kind of breaking news and the news moments sometimes you have to start slightly where people are and then you have to get them engaged and educate them as, as you go. So for example, I know that social care is absolutely not just about care homes and it's far more broader than that. Um, but right now in the news, there's a lot of conversation ab about care homes and the COVID response and how people aren't able to have the choice over that. So, you know, that's where people are starting to talking about care in the wider public in the news right now. So maybe some 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 intervention around that that then, then brings people in to be like, actually that's not just what social care is and it's not just how social care has to be. Um, and through kind of uh, as you bring people into your campaign if like Paul said you do something that that gathers your email their email addresses then you're able to kind of send them information and take them on a bit of a journey to where you want them to be um, I mean that's just one example but I'm sure there's others I think it's possibly thinking about those moments where people do have some kind of interaction with social care for themselves or someone in their family I also think it's about telling some of your own stories about um, about what that is and um, and sharing that um, and maybe thinking about you know where people that might be share similar values to you might be hanging out or what other causes they might support and maybe some collaborations but really if you can find a moment where 
it's crossing someone's agenda and and into and and have an opportunity for them to get involved with you at that point whether it's a petition or a campaign or following you on twitter or whatever then you can then you have to start to take them on on a bit of a journey um to understand more um and you can do that by sending them emails over time news stories etc i don't know paul if you've got more to add on that because that that is the kind of hundred dollar question i would say that's the challenge yeah, definitely. I think I'd go, um, I'll just add to that. And I, and I, th I think maybe you've covered it. So apologies if you have is, is, is thinking a, a, about your potential supporter or the, the people who would support you and just trying to put yourself for a moment into, into their kind of shoes in terms of where they are, kind of who they are and um, what media they consume and, and, and the kind of language that they, that they use. And invariably it comes down to being, in, in trying to make very complicated things as simple as possible without being reductive. So it's a complex issue that you all work in. However, we need at those moments to build those kind of surge moments to break that down into the kind of the statement maybe that somebody can agree with, a kind of this concept of a value statement that you could put out there that's, that says what you stand for and asks for people to agree is a technique that I've seen used quite successfully by quite a lot of the kind of political, the progressive political groups um, in the USA. And another thing that um, Kat mentioned was kind of having the people that you work with or the people who are um, the kind of um, who 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 have who are who are the kind of the, the the constituent that you are working with have people tell their own story and use those stories to really bring people close. Mm. Yeah, um, yeah, and I think also people you've got to think how people can relate to you. you no, know, people can relate to um, I don't know. Yeah, the the stories really well. One of the one of the top. Um, subject lines of any email we used to send out at change.org was always something like my sister name my mum name my brother so sometimes it's about if people don't have that personal experience themselves are they likely to know someone that does or you know and sometimes that's a way to bring people in there's loads of questions in the chat so um, I'm going to throw two quick fire ones to you Paul and then we're going to dive into a couple of chunky ones yeah. but Tony asked um, so two questions for you Paul Tony asked can you give some examples between passive and active language and then there was another good question from Jenny who asked have you have you got any experience with making social media accessible for people who are digitally excluded and not confident or need to use access software, any sort of resources you'd recommend? Yeah. So on the first one, the kind of passive and active, I um, I think sometimes as groups, we have the um, we have a hesitancy to be confident about the things that we want people to do. Um, so we can sometimes start interjecting our ask with words like could help or would help or can help. And what we and I'm what I'm an advocate of are kind of stripping those bits of language out. And if we're telling a story, for instance, in a social media post or in an email, is tell that story, but then be extremely clear about what we would like the reader to do next. So sign this or agree with this. I'll give you a very, very quick example. I um I, um, I, I used to hang out with the team behind Bernie 2016, the kind of election program a few years ago, and they were testing buttons on a website to encourage people to uh, sign up, join us, or submit, no, sorry, they had an email sign up button with the word submit on it, which when you think about it is a really weird word. But when they put a value statement out and put on the button, I agree, that's when they started to see more response in that moment so it's just the kind of we use sometimes complicated language on the question around accessibility i think we're very much platform driven when it comes to the subject of accessibility however i'm really pleased that facebook and linkedin and instagram and i'm not so much sure around twitter they've started to add in accessibility um, elements to their to their platform so when we're publishing on their platforms we can add metadata, which helps screen readers and other and other things. Um, I think the technology is starting to, to grow. I think the challenge is that not enough um, people who use social media are, are routinely using the features that are there already. And I think there's a huge amount of work 
that organizations can do to train their own social media staff on what's available now and what they should be doing now as best practice. Thanks, Paul. Um, and I think there's a lot of simple tools, even if you um, are, are quite a social media or tech novice, some of the platforms like change.org and so on are quite easy to kind of set up these petitions. So you don't need to, um, you don't need to have a big budget or an expensive, you know, or a tech team to kind of to, to get in, involved. Now there's loads of great questions that are kind of around the similar theme about movement building. So I'm going to just read a couple of them and then um, Paul and I will try and dive into them as best we can. So Kevin's asked, is there a selection criteria to decide if a movement is the right approach and the likelihood of it being successful? Um, and also, does social care future consider itself to be a movement, which I think is a question for you all to think about, or maybe um, during the session or after. Some people nodding, some people said yes in the chat. Um, and then someone, um, sorry, I'm just kind of trying to scan through these because I saw some great questions. Um, so then these two other questions are kind of similar vein as well. Have you have you anything to see say about lessons from movements that are made up of lots of smaller component parts rather than one massive Greenpeace style NGO? We definitely can talk about that. And then also for social care, we need to make a movement within the public, the staff, the managers, the civil servants, and elected officials. Would you propose a separate mobilization for each of the subset groups? Um, so yeah, I'll, well, I think we'll kick off those. So it's kind of the idea of like, what is a movement? How is it successful? And, and also if you're trying to attract lots of different audiences, are they all part of the same, you know, the same mobilization or on how does that work? Um, Paul, um, shall I dive in a little bit, Paul, and then you join in? Yeah. I mean, so I always think if you sit there at home and think, oh, I'm going to start a movement, that's probably not the best approach. And I think lots of NGOs and so on think they're going to do that. I think start doing stuff, start campaigning, and you'll know that you're part of a movement when other people are getting involved and, and doing things that, you know, you hadn't even planned. Um, so so you don't necessarily, you know, I'm sure Marcus Rashford didn't sit there and think he was going to start a food poverty movement, but actually just by getting involved and start being inspiring and having those visions and values he started I think the key to success is, is what Paul really laid out clearly clear values a really inspiring vision and then looking for these moments where you can really hook people in compel them to take action and and um, surge with you and those moments are hard to find but once you start knowing what to look for and how to spot them and being ready to have the action the petition the thing people can do then it will snowball and in terms of all the different audiences that you talked about I would really say um, and I've done a lot of kind of work you know government officials, policy makers, et cetera. And the one thing I would say is that they're all people. And actually the, the thing that connects them all is often they might have different values or opinions, some of them, depending where they all sit, but they are people with values. And often if you have a really inspiring vision, then that is the thing that bring, is going to bring people together. So you actually don't, I think, need to change your messages as much as you might think for the different audiences. Um, and I often think sometimes you think you have to go to policymakers with like the detailed plan of what you want to happen. Actually, you need to go to them of like, this is the problem that needs to change and the compelling, compelling ask for why it needs to change and the vision of how the world should be. And if you're at the point of having the conversation about the details of that, then you're winning. Like you're at the table and you're winning because you're, they're, they're asking you how to make the change, right? But getting to the table in a powerful way to have that conversation is a challenge. So I don't think you need to break it down too much. I think if you do, it can get too messy and complicated and actually people, whatever their role and job, will be inspired by your vision um, and be, want to be a part of, part of that. Paul, do you want to chip in and especially kind of Greenpeace, lots of different yeah. smaller ones and any other thoughts? On that subject you were just talking about, I think it, it, it made me think of a, of a project that I was involved in, which was a very big environmental group who had a kind of influencing team who wanted to affect policy and had a direct contact with um, MPs and also a mobilization team who were looking to kind of drive public awareness and drive public interaction with the with the, the change they were looking to make. And the way that they brought those two things together is that they set a goal for the mobilization team of giving the supporter base the skills, the energy, the confidence and the materials in a general election environment to change what MPs were hearing across the doorstep when they knocked doors. So they made a very clear moment, which is we can influence, the influencing team can influence MPs 
But what we want to do to support that goal is to have MPs hearing more about our issue on the doorstep. So they've really, really worked hard to put their issue up the agenda of their supporter bases um, issued when that door knock came during the kind of general election campaign. And on that concept of um, kind of small, small groups in a, in a movement, I would really echo what Kat said. I don't think, and I say this to large INGOs all the time, is that you cannot start a movement if you're I don't want to name someone in case they're on the call, but you can't you can't start you can't start a movement. It's very uh, you know you can't put your brand on it and claim something as your own. If you think about the environmental movement, then there are commercial organisations who would say they were in the movement. There are very really small groups who are part of that movement in terms of very specific parts of the environmental issue. And then if you just think about some of those large NGOs and think about their personalities, you've kind of got from Greenpeace to the National Trust to the RSPB, to Friends of the Earth, where there's a whole, a whole different spectrum of how they operate within that movement. I think what's critical to movement, it has many actors and many kind of, kind of, kind of points of view with, within it, but this kind of shared uh, goal. And that collaboration word, I think, comes into play, and it's really important, that real collaboration between various actors in a specific movement will drive more change than people competing with each other for press or support for time. Um, yeah. Great. Um, so we've just got a few minutes left. I'm, apolog I'm gonna apologize now if I miss any questions. It's just, um, there's a, got lots of great chat, so it's hard. There was two questions that were similar that I thought we'd have a bit of time to go into. Someone, I've lost it now, but someone said, um, how much emphasis do you do on positive or negative kind of actions? There was a question that was similar to that. And then um, Sarah's asked, in what context do you think emphasizing a problem is mobilizing and in what context does it lead to fatalism? So I thought I'd just give you one more bit of jargon that we sometimes use in campaigning that answers some of those questions and it is crisisunity which is the word crisis and the word opportunity and when we're talking about designing compelling actions and the, the question John asked about how do you engage people um, to start with often what we're looking for is the moment of crisisunity which basically means there's some urgency something bad's happening or gonna happen there's this urgent moment of jeopardy but we right now have an opportunity to act and if we act we can make change so often what we're looking for is those moments of crisis opportunity and that's where you can really engage people um so for example we're coming up to christmas you know i'm talking to some families that have lost loved ones due to covid and we're talking about how can we get the government to give more support to them people that are grieving and so we're looking at well christmas is this moment of crisis for people when they're going to be at home on their own for the first time um but it's also an opportunity if the government acts now to, to support people and to make this Christmas easier. So there's different ways that you can kind of use that crisis opportunity framework to try and find those moments and hooks. Um, yeah, there's so much great chat going on here. I think we should um, save it. I'm conscious of time. Um, Neil, Neil's um, talking a lot about sort of the research and the work you're doing around the vision that you have, but also how do you bridge that vision so people that don't think it's too far away. So um, I think we should probably, oh, Kevin's asking, are we on LinkedIn? Are you asking if we're on LinkedIn or do we use LinkedIn? Paul and I are both on LinkedIn and we're on Twitter mm -hmm. and we're on there far too much to actually get proper work done. So feel free to connect with us and find us on there. Um, and um, I, I will share our details. Um, Paul, maybe put your details in the chat. I'll put my, this is me on Twitter. Um, so yeah, connect with us. I'd love to keep talking with you all. Um, so feel free to get in touch, in, any questions, any help as we can kind of help you as you're thinking this through, please do. Um, Paul, any final words from you? I've, I'm gonna I'm gonna let everyone go. I loved it. Thank you so much for inviting me. Yeah. To we're really we're Probably both super work. excited can I just, yeah, go on oh. go on Anna yeah chip go on sorry I don't know who else um I was just going to say a big thank you really to you both for that and that's been really inspiring and um we've already had some conversations before this and we will continue to have those conversations with how we can work with you better as social care future I'm, I'm kind of now visualizing this sort of you know massive campaign where everyone suddenly knows what social care is and is is calling for our vision for everyone's lives rather than just um yeah but only 3.5 percent 
<laughs> oh yeah okay not everyone just less, less than, yeah. Um, yeah will be enough but yeah it's it's yeah. been really exciting so definitely we'll keep this conversation going and it's it brilliant great. thank you Thank you. No, thanks for having us. And um, honestly, you have so much potential. And this is a movement that needs to exist in the world because we need this change. So please, please keep going. Um, and we will love to help you and support you any way we can. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of your conference. Thank keep you. Keep in touch with us. Bye. Speak Thank soon. You. Thank you. Bye.